Welcome back. We're hearing about it a lot. Corporations giving employees bonuses as a result of the new tax law. Just this week, Disney announcing that it is giving 125,000 of its employees a $1,000 cash bonus and spending $50 million to create a new higher education program to co cover tuition costs. Other companies are raising the minimum wage of some employees to $15 an hour. All good stuff, right? Joining us for more is Michael Snipes, an economics instructor at USF Sarasota Manatee, Frank Alcock, a political science professor at New College, Rod Thompson, president of the Sarasota Republican Club, and ABC7 business editor Richard Stern. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Michael, I'm going to start with you. If you could help us separate fact from fiction, because we, we do hear about all these companies giving their employees bonuses and other things, raising the minimum wage, but we also hear other people saying that it's not going to do much to help middle class Americans like those right here on the Sun Coast. Sure, and, and, and it really is a bit of a mixed bag. You do hear a lot of, of companies coming out and making statements that they're going to increase wages, they're going to do all these programs. And that's good, right? That might be a sign that things are actually working out the way the plan was intended to. But then again, at the same time, we also hear a lot of stories of companies who are taking these tax breaks and using them to buy back stock, not necessarily reinvesting it back into the economy. So it's, it's still a little bit of a mixed bag. Some, you hear some good news, you hear some bad news. But what that might mean for people here in the middle class, well, I mean, if you're not working for Disney, that may not necessarily help you. Uh, uh, Frank, is this simply a, a, a situation that, uh, depending on your political point of view, you're going to see it all as good news or all as bad news? Where is the middle? I th there is a middle there, but let's keep things in perspective. Let's take um, Apple. Um, they announced the bonus plan that's going to cost some $300 million next year. I mean, and they're going to gain probably about over $40 billion in tax benefits. And so what you're seeing, and I think uh, you can see this Bank of America and Disney, yes, they are announcing bonuses. In many cases, it's the bonus. It's not a real wage increase. But they're taking, for every dollar uh, that they're getting in terms of tax benefits, what's this plan? They're throwing a penny or two uh, to their employees. And yeah, so it's helpful. You don't turn it down. But the, the vast majority uh, of this money is not being reinvested into workers. Yeah, you know, Rod, I, I saw Paul Ryan on TV this week basically slamming his hand down on the podium saying, told you, it's working. It will work. It's going to continue to work. Right. I've not seen any numbers that Frank was referring to where it's one or two pennies on the dollar that's being sent to workers. Um, when companies have extra money like this, they can invest it in their workers. They can do the things that Disney's done. They can increase the minimum wage, which many of them have done. They can reinvest it in their company, making them more competitive, creating more opportunities to be able to hire more employees. This is all good. I'm a little bit baffled at the idea that all this good that's happening, but it's not enough good, when the other party totally voted against even this. So I'm happy with what we got, and I think most Americans are too, even if they don't get the Disney bonuses or the $15 an hour minimum. Times article a couple days ago. Okay, Richard, have we seen an impact on, on the new tax plan on the stock market yet? Well, Alan, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that because we've seen an impact on the stock market since November 8th of 2016. And uh, I don't mean that politically, it's just simply fact. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up by more than 8,000 points since November the 8th of 16, up 44 percent. So where you want to draw the line and say, when did it start? When did it stop? When it, it hasn't stopped, and it's just been phenomenal. Okay, we are just going to get, take a short break. We are just getting warmed up. We'll have much more on the new tax law and the middle class right after we check the first alert weather. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking about the impact of the new tax law on the middle class here living on the Sun Coast. And joining us for more is Michael Snipes, an economics instructor at USF Sarasota Manatee, Frank Alcock, a political science professor at New College, Rod Thompson, president of the Sarasota Republican Club, and ABC7 business editor Richard Stern. And let me start with you, Richard, because a lot of people, I would imagine, in the middle class on the Sun Coast are hoping to get to the point where they're savings and investments are not just their 401k, that they have a little bit extra to put into the market so they could do business with folks like you. Exactly. And the 401k, regardless of one's income level, last year, depending on how the allocation was, you should have been up somewhere like 20%. So 401k really doesn't discriminate based on wealth. But uh, a lot of people have trouble creating wealth until that last kid is left for college and is out of college. So most of the people we deal with are in their mid-50s, if not older. And looking at mid six figures, if not seven figures. So these people are not impacted 
day to day by the fact that maybe they're going to get an extra couple hundred dollars a month because of tax savings. They're looking at the fact that interest rates are terrible and they're going to put their money somewhere and that somewhere has been the stock market. Michael, is it the hope of those who were behind this tax plan that eventually it's going to increase the pace that middle income salaries here on the Sun Coast and elsewhere do rise? Yeah, that, that, that's the whole idea, that the, the tax breaks that bigger corporations or wealthier individuals get will get reinvested back into the economy, and then that reinvestment grows the economy, and that should grow wages. And, and that, that, that's fine as a theory, right? I, I don't necessarily completely disagree with it. The, the, pr the issue comes up is that when that theory gets put into practice in the real world, it, it has to, in order for the whole process to work, the money has to be reinvested. And if there's not reinvestment back into the economy, really the whole idea tends to fall apart. And I recently read a statistic that right now, really only about 17% is really reinvested back into the economy. And that leaves, you know, 83% that's not being reinvested. That's going back to shareholders or profit or wherever. And, and Rod, I guess here's the question to you. Um, do folks like yourself um, basically throw out all criticism uh, that this was the right type of tax plan done in the right way? Do we throw out, in other words, the Any Democrats? Kind of and not, not just okay. Democrats, but there are plenty of people out no. there who, who question about the tactics, the strategy, and what this tax plan is designed to do. Well, I wouldn't say I would throw it all out. Um, I think the tactics and the strategy, as far as getting it passed, is just how Congress works. But as far as how the, the content. The impact. Yeah, the content and impact of it. Um, I think I don't throw it all out, but I, when I listen to it, all I keep hearing is a criticism, essentially, is the best ground possible from my point of view, and that's that the tax relief wasn't enough. I think if our conversation at this table is that there wasn't enough middle income tax relief, I'm totally on board to coming back next year and seeing what we can do about that. Alex, right. if you are in the middle quintile, uh, explain what a quintile is. <laughs> it's the it's the middle class. It's it's if you are making between forty and eighty thousand uh, dollars, you would nine hundred dollars. That's what you're going to save in your tax bill uh, this year. If you're in the top one percent, it's going to be over fifty one thousand dollars. That's a, just a dramatic difference. Over half of these tax savings are going to the, the top 1% will be the recipients uh, of that. And if we come back on the middle class, if you happen to be purchasing your own individual insurance, uh, and if you make enough money so you don't qualify for subsidies, uh, you're in your 50s or early 60s, your premiums are going to go up more than your tax savings. Look, the, the reason for those numbers is that, is that the top percent of income earners pay an out, outlandish amount of the total taxes. So the top 1% earn 21% of earned income, but they pay 39% of taxes. And if you take just the income tax before and after, they'll be paying an actual larger percentage overall, which is why some conservative sites have been complaining it's actually a progressive plan in that respect. So Michael, when we talk about the middle class here on the Sun Coast, are the tax savings on your income taxes combined with maybe whatever kind of bonus you might get with the company, keeping pace here on the Sun Coast with, with the increase year to year in the cost of living. Sure, and, and I think that that's an interesting thing that we need to distinguish here because for, for many years, incomes have not been increasing at the same rate that prices have in, been increasing. And that means that people can afford to buy less things. And so the, the point was raised, well, I mean, if that's the case, what about if we have wage increases plus these tax breaks? that might be able to keep pace with inflation, but what that really comes back to is, well, are these tax cuts going to be permanent? And if, if they are permanent, are they going to be big enough to keep up with prices with inflation? Richard, you and I have talked on your business segment regularly about the issue when, I, I remember that, um, that, that picture with Gary Cohn, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, asking uh, CEOs in this room, what are you going to do with the savings in terms of the corporate taxes? Who is going to apply it back to raising wages and who, and so forth? And very few of them wrote, raised their hands. Um, when you hear criticism that uh, the, the savings on the corporate tax level is just going to go to invest, uh, those investing into the company, you know, how do you respond to that? Well, I think each company really has to stand on its own. Many of these companies, and Disney being an example, setting up an educational fund for higher education for their employees, I think is terrific. I think I have to make one comment. I live in a very different world than the rest of you. 
my world is people who are incredibly confident. They're seeing their accounts growing. They're taking vacations. Uh, Ford can't make enough F-150 pickup trucks to keep up. I mean, people are spending money. You go to restaurants, they're full. Uh, I, I fully understand where everyone else is coming from, but my world is a very different world. People are really and, happy. And Rod, that is, the, that is the majority of the Sun Coast, even though we are one of the most affluent communities in the country. And you know, I found this newspaper article when we were talking about the cuts to the corporate tax rate. There are kinds of corporations, C-type corporations, uh, which are basically pass-through income, uh, $50,000 and less, and under this new tax plan, those people are going to pay an additional $3,000 a year in taxes. Okay, well, I, I'm unaware of that, um, so I'd have to look into the details of it. But I think to, to what he was saying, though, was the, the description he is of people buying F-150 trucks and, and going to restaurants, they're buying a lot because there's so much more money. That is exactly supply-side economics. That's exactly what you would expect to be seeing from uh, a strong economy and an effective tax cut even before it's taken effect. I think once people really see what it is and it starts taking effect over the next several months, you're going to see a really dramatically different attitude towards the tax plan from Americans when polls are done. Huffington Post just had a poll. It's already 10 percentage points more popular than it was when it was passed. Frank, how about that? Wage stagnation uh, and inequality have uh, really damaged the American worker over the last few decades. There's, you know, productivity in our economy and real wage growth kind of were lockstep up until the 70s, and they've departed in a drastic way. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, this tax plan, where the vast majority of benefits go to the upper income brackets, are going to trickle down. I don't know what's going to change. Uh, if we start seeing real wage growth uh, in a year, in, in two years, and we don't see as much going to uh, buyback stocks and dividends, and they're actually investments in productivity, and, and we're seeing real wage growth, then I'll turn around and say, Michael, great, you are the uh, economic, uh, you, the uh, economist in the room here, so to speak. Do you see this tax program as a way to reverse that trend that Frank is talking about in terms of stagnant wages among the middle class living here on the Sun Coast? Un unfortunately, the jury's still out. Uh, it, it really is, it's, it's really just going to take time to see exactly how companies are going to respond. Are they actually going to follow through on what they say? If they do, and again, I, I, I'm with you, if, if we do actually see the wage increases that are being predicted or being promised, I'll be, I'll be the first one to say the, the plan was a success. But it really does depend upon how well the, the things that are being stated are actually followed through in the real world. I think some of them will be, but there's still pennies on the dollar. Yeah, think, people yeah. don't understand how big I, those tax havens yeah, are. That's true. I, I'm having a problem only in the sense that because I do live in that different world, profit is not a dirty word. Correct. And right. if companies buy back stock, they're reducing the amount of shares outstanding. They're going to make money. As they're making money, they're making more money per share. Up goes the price of the stock. People feel better. They spend, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I for feel a certain segment of the community, and for those people who are not invested in the stock market, other than a 401k, they're not really joining in that success. I agree. A unless that company then, because of what he just described, is able to reinvest in their company, is able to hire more people, then actually it can participate. But is there a difference between hiring more people and increasing middle income? Um, well, there might be, or there might not be. It depends. I think that the, the wage stagnation one is not a tax policy discussion. It's a regulation discussion because regulation costs so much for businesses. And if you have less regulation, you might have more money available to pay employees and technology. All right, we have to take a quick break, and we'll be back for final thoughts when we return. And our guests join us right now for final thoughts. And Frank, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Um, do you predict that this new tax plan tax law is going to have somewhat of a positive impact here in on the Sun Coast with middle income families. Uh, it, very small for most income families um, relative to high income families again are going to get a big uh, boost. Let's remember though this is not free. It's not like we're pulling money out of the sky. This is going to add a trillion and a half dollars to our debt over a 10 year period and what happens in order to avoid that there's going to be or even to cut back on that there's going to be pressure put on big ticket items and so things like Medicaid, Social Security where a lot, a lot of middle income people depend upon these things that's where you're going to see the squeeze so you get a little benefit now big squeeze coming down the road. Respond to that Ron. 
Um, baffled again at the sudden discovery of the deficit by Democrats after it went up ten trillion dollars. Be that as it may. But but look, baffled we're talking by the about suddenly it doesn't matter so, anymore to the so Republicans. So one one point five trillion over ten years when it was ten trillion in eight years, one point five trillion over ten years, um, on top of the twenty some trillion it is now. We're talking about seven and a half percent. So I don't think it's Armageddon, as one senator called it, to, um, to have add that to the deficit. Plus, I don't think we will, because I think because of the supply side sort of economics we're seeing happen, and because of the growing economy, you are going to see growing revenues that you don't see in the um, CBO uh, budget analysis of it, and, and that's okay. actually going to reduce that deficit rate. Uh, Richard, I am old enough to remember a time when the stock market seemed to react to growing concern about the size of the federal deficit. What happened right. to that? I think it got lost in a lot of different ways, and uh, I don't know that I have a perfect answer for you, but I guess I just want to make sure that people understand that this tax law is clearly the rich are going to get richer. They really are. But I would say that people should do what we call in my business fundamental research. If you go into Home Depot and the place is mobbed, then maybe you should buy the stock. If you order stuff from Amazon four times a week, maybe you should buy the stock. That's not such a bad thing. Michael, I'm going to give you the, the, uh, the last word here, and I know you're an economist and you don't have a crystal ball, but if we had convened this panel one year from now, would we find that just middle-income families here on the Sun Coast are in a better place? My prediction would, would be that they might be better off, but it would be not not really more well enough off to really address some of the bigger problems so one of the big problems that a lot of middle incomes family face is student loan debt so if if you have an additional four hundred dollars a month that's great that's not going to make a debt on forty thousand dollars that sounds like another show gentlemen thank you very much for for joining us tonight before we go we want to share with you what some of you had to say about last night's show on the real estate market on the sun coast it wasn't too long ago that real estate was in the ditch we saw it with the foreclosures short sales you name it but now the market is booming the sale of luxury homes during the second half of last year that's all of richard's clients was up sixty one percent we also saw a 9% increase in homes in the $200,000 to $400,000 range. We went to Facebook, and here is what some of you have to say. Alice says, but rises in people's income does not match. Regina says, obviously, some can't get a break. Incomes have stayed the same, and people renting can't save to purchase because they are paying the high price of ridiculous rents. Carol says, many folks cannot afford a $250,000 plus home, but that seems to be all that is being built in the newer developments. Well, if you'd like to join the conversation on tonight's topic, just visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash mysuncoast.com.abc7. And FYI, you can watch past discussions on demand. They're available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. And for the latest on local breaking news, don't forget to download the updated version of our app. If your current app doesn't work, it's expired. Just go to the App Store and re-download it for, by searching for WWSB or My Suncoast. We want to thank all our guests for being here tonight. Michael Snipes is an economics instructor at USF Sarasota Manatee. Frank Alcock is a political science professor at New College. Rod Thompson is the president of the Sarasota Republican Club. And ABC7's Richard Stern is our business editor.